This is Jay Michaels. I'm a professor of media culture and communications, and I have been clocking science fiction, fantasy, and horror films for over 50 years. And I'm thrilled to bring you some fantastic television here on the Boston Sci-Fi Channel. Now, we have with us today, members of the filmmakers whose movies are going to be shown at this year's SF48. That's the 48th annual Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival in Boston starting February 15. Um, 48 years, my gosh, terrific. Um, and the other thing that's terrific is all their movies. This is about the fourth year in a row that I've been interviewing members of the filmmakers uh, for the festival. And I'm always amazed at the imagination. I'm always amazed at the energy. I'm always amazed at the ingenuity it takes to put up an indie film. And we're going to hear all about that. I am joined today by Jen Bush. Jen is a New York writer at large. And uh, uh, if, if we were to line up all her festival and convention passes end to end, they're somewhere out in the solar system. Jen, how are you? I am really good and I'm really excited to hear about all of these films. I wrote the film descriptions for the program for Boston Sci-Fi. So I am absolutely fascinated by the films entered into the festival this year. Oh, okay, but, but fess up. Somewhere around two o'clock in the morning when you got up to film 75 <laughs> and you found yourself going, oh. And a robot landed on the planet and fell in love with a spirit. And that's what, oh God, not a, uh, did, it, did it reach that point for you? No, because all of the films truly are innovative. Yes, there are robots and aliens, but they're all really interesting. There's uh, one of my favorite stories that I tell is Rod Serling uh, to escape the censors because his morality tales were always uh, eviscerated by the censors, such as Judgment at Nuremberg or, uh, or Requiem for a Heavyweight. And so what he did, he created a series where he had his morality tales, but instead of it being racism, it became uh, uh, the difference between robots and ghosts. And somehow the censors let it all go and we had many seasons of the Twilight Zone telling us immense stories uh, with parables that dug deep within our hearts. Let's start immediately. Joan, Joan, tell us about you. Tell us about your film. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Can you hear me? Yep, I certainly can. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think I'm frozen. Hang on. All right. Joan, we're going to come back to you the moment you, you land here back on planet Earth. You're, you're, you're off in another dimension, uh, which works perfectly because this year the Boston Sci-Fi Festival is celebrating 60 years of Doctor Who. So, so you, you, let, you let me know what time zone you're, you're in at the moment. Um, Nicholas, Nicholas, lay it on us. Tell us about your film. Hello, Jay. Uh, thank you. I uh, I am the director of 395, which is a uh, a sci-fi short film, which will be showing at your amazing festival next month. Um, it's really it's a post-apocalyptic story about a, a mysterious, nameless wanderer who seems to be searching for other survivors using uh, whatever tools the post-apocalypse affords her. And it was a a real attempt to do uh, I call big canvas, small wallet sci-fi uh, to try and tell an ambitious story when, like most filmmakers, I am completely broke. How did you do it? How did you, the, you, you had, when you say big canvas, you're absolutely right, the apocalypse. Okay, it's going to happen. We're all betting on it. What it's going to look like, we have absolutely no idea. And and uh, ironically, I was reading an article that every, almost every science fiction movie has since changed because of the 2020 pandemic, looking at our apocalypse. What was your apocalypse and what, what did you do to accomplish it? Well, we, uh, we primarily used landscapes that are along uh, a real highway in California, the 395 highway. So that was the inspiration for the title. And it was a favorite road trip of mine. And I knew a lot of sites along it that were sparse and incredibly beautiful and that there weren't people lurking around asking you for your film permit. Uh, so myself, one actor and one crew person took a three day road trip in an SUV with just the gear we could carry in one SUV and just shot anywhere that had uh, an amazing backdrop. We were really inspired by like A, Hayao Miyazaki and his uh, incredible animated films and the way they depict nature 
Uh, and then also kind of the contemplative, like environmental themed sci-fi of the seventies, like silent running or like the final third of Logan's run. We wanted to do these things where like the world really helped us to, to tell the story and evoke the mood uh, and saved us some money because, you know, I didn't have to buy a mountain. It was already there. There you go. Oh, well put. It's funny that I mentioned the Twilight Zone because there was an episode of the Twilight Zone where, uh, uh, where, where, where basically they did the same thing. It was their, their version of, of the future and it was along a roadway and I gather in California, depending on where it was filmed. So, so you're, you're, you're old school and new school at the same time. So it was just you, it was just you, a cameraman and your actor. Uh, well, I was the cameraman actually on top of being the director. We, it was myself, the actor, and then just at one crew person, Elizabeth Sarah, an amazing filmmaker in her own right, just doing everything we didn't have hands for. Uh, including driving the vehicle. And I, I came up with the idea, honestly, because I needed to practice cinematography. Uh, I come from a live theater background and I'd used the same cinematographer on a number of projects in a row. And I said, sooner or later, I got to take responsibility and understand what you're doing. So I'm going to write a dialogue free piece that I have to operate the camera myself. So it's sink or swim. I'm going to learn how this thing works. You know, it's so ironic. Your film is basically it's it's a story within a story. It's yes, it's your your apocalyptic version, but it's like, OK, we're the last people on Earth and we have to film this. You know, you can't very well turn around and say, oh, go into the trailer and get me another or or, or please call up the producer in California and tell him to uh, really marvelous. Uh, I, I give you a lot of credit. Uh, for, Thank you, Jay. Because that's the bravery. That's the bravery of it. What it, and and I come from a, a theatrical background also, so it's it's yeah, it's it's guerrilla theater. So I really I really appreciate that, and I look forward to that film. Uh, Thank you. This year I'm going to be at the event. Normally normally I'm only on uh, uh, I'm only I'm only virtual, but this year I'm going to be there, and I look forward to seeing as many as I possibly can while I'm there. All righty, Joan, you're back with us. The, the thing works. Tell us about your movie now. <laughs> Sorry, I cut out before. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, our film short. Uh, our film is short. Uh, it's called New Air, and it is about a mother and a daughter stranded on a distant planet far, far in the future. Our director Leo really wanted to tell a story, uh, starting you know with this very intimate relationship, but really exploring what happens when a civilization goes from zero to one and then one back to zero. So that's kind of. So we have another uh, apocalyptic sort of thought here. A little bit. I think he's really exploring human nature. You know, he's he's exploring what happens when we have the need to find a plan B for civilization, and what what happens when that plan B goes wrong. Um, that that's kind of the thread he's exploring. Why'd you do it? Why why did you make this film? Well. <laughs> For one thing, we love sci-fi, of course, <laughs> but uh, we we actually we kind of wanted to prove something, which is that this film was shot entirely with virtual production. We, I, I'm a producer at a studio called Versatile Medium, and we really we specialize in virtual production. And we made this short because we kind of we got tired of people feeling like you know you can't do this with this technology, like it's not there yet. Uh, virtual production is just a background that you use for part of your production. We wanted to show that there's actually you know artistic creative merit to using this technology. So we shot this entire film without any VFX you know VFX post production. That's that's something we wanted to prove could be done. You're you're another one. You're going back to old school, the days of. Uh... When you when you look at the old German expressionistic movies like Nosferatu or, or or Caligari, you're seeing just shadow play. You're seeing just the ingenuity of the artist at that moment. It looks like it looks like you're you're the same yeah. sort of uh, uh, milieu on that. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I think like the word we like to use it, it feels organic. You know, it's for the organic. type of filmmaker who finds their feeling on set and you know likes to see things and move around on set. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. I, uh, as as I said to Nicholas, yes, I'm. I, uh, Jen and I both are, are theatrical backgrounds, and and it, things just occur when you're on stage, and you say, "Oh, keep that in," and you don't think you have that in a film. I'm so glad you have it in yours. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Looking no. looking forward to it. I'll be the one in the audience going, "Wow!" Uh, uh, as it's running. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I see. I see a nameplate that says ABC. Okay, you've attracted my attention. Who are you? It's simply my 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 initials. I didn't fill in my name. My name's Alan. I'm Alan Sepos. 
And those are my initials that my parents happened to have given me. I'm an actor and I'm in a film called That Cold Dead Look in Your Eyes. It's a film directed by Owner Tukal, who's relatively well known in this world. Uh, it's science fiction, but probably more just a drama. It's a feature and it's about a 40 year old, not me, who everything goes wrong in his life. And he's about to celebrate his 40th birthday and the film, as the film progresses, we just see how everything is terrible for him. And I happen to be the father of his girlfriend who makes life even worse for him. That's so it's genuinely film. things are bad. It's not his interpretation. Oh, no, things are bad. Things are bad for him. And there's a, other things that happen that he can't really control that make it even worse for him. Okay. Um, uh, how many show of hands how many of this sounds like a day in your life sometimes uh how does this how does this uh, be sci-fi what's the science fiction angle of this or can well you uh, there's there's a, a whole thing about 5g you know that affects the world that we live in and how it the waves of 5g affects him as well and that brings in the science fiction although when we shot it it was, we didn't know what was going to happen with 5G and all the press that's come about. So the writer and director owner was kind of provoyant for that. He saw things and it, it's, it's become even more, sci it's, it's become less sci-fi fiction and more real as the days go by, which is kind of interesting, but it still is sci-fi. And it's in French, by the way, the whole film is in French. Oh, that's so cool. That's so, please tell me the subtitle. It is subtitled, correct. Oh. And you I'm speak fluent French. I'm trying to learn Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to learn Italian. And, and every once in a while, my wife and I will watch a movie without the subtitles. Uh, Don't know it enough. Actually, actually, I'm in France right now. So I'm in a different time zone. What so, time is it in France right now? Six hours later. Oh, OK. Oh, okay. Not, not too terrible. No, not too in the morning. I, I, I might not be here if it was too in the morning. I, I had uh, I had a, an interview with someone in Ireland at one point, and I, I said, well, can we try this? And he said, can we hurry up? It's one o'clock in the morning here. I was like, oh, never mind. Never mind. But I will be at the festival. I'm coming oh, to excellent. the festival. Well, then we look forward to meeting you. Uh, two thoughts sparked in my head. The first um, is, is the term elevated horror. I preach the term elevated horror, and it's very it seems to be gathering steam now, and it's basically... Uh, raising what what people consider the b-movie the horror movie into this very topical very uh, very powerful way of thinking you have films like parasite and the shape of water uh and now and now uh the new one up for an academy award everything everywhere all at once or oh. something like that am i right jen am i right with that title okay thank you uh and, and so your sounds like it's elevated science fiction I think that would fall into that category. I think you're correct. And and I'm patting your your director and your creator on the back. I have spouted for most of those half a century that I've been playing with horror movies and science fiction that they are clairvoyant. If we just watched, uh, if we just watched, uh, 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 oh my gosh, what was the name of, what was the name of the movie? It was 2011 Contagion. If we just watched mm -hmm. Contagion, maybe a little harder we well, zoom wouldn't have stock prices the way they are uh so i i look forward to your movie and sitting there going oh okay there you go billy billy tell me about your film hi everyone um my film is a featured documentary it's called it's quieter in the twilight it's about um the tiny team of engineers piloting the two voyager spacecraft through interstellar space. Um, it's this tiny, you know, 10 person team. They've been with the mission, which is NASA's longest running mission. Uh, most of them since the eighties and they're all, you know, past retirement age. And it's sort of, it's about their commitment to that mission and keeping these spacecraft going, you know, billions of miles away and the first man-made objects in interstellar space. Wow. Uh, an another intellectual pursuit. Really, really interesting. Why, why people from the eighties? I'm being <laughs> selfish when I say it. Why, why create that sort of imagery? 
Um, well, I don't know if it was tied just to that sort of imagery. I, I was drawn to it. Um, there was an article about them in the New York Times for Voyager's 40th anniversary. And I was drawn to the just this really small team and they work in this nondescript building. It's not like this elaborate sci-fi looking thing. It looks like a it could be an insurance agency where they work. It's drab and they, you know, cubicles. And that's where, you know, this amazing feat of exploration is taking place. Um, and I, I was drawn to that juxtaposition of this, this incredible feat of science and engineering. And it's happening at, you know, along this nondescript road in Southern California. Um, and also, of course, their, their incredible commitment. I mean, they're, they will not leave that mission until they cease to be or the spacecraft cease to be. Um, they're just, I was drawn to that dedication. You're, you're, you're handing me two parables, which I really appreciate. Num number one, yes, the, the something from nothing philosophy. You know, when we, when we look at the space program in general, it all began with President Kennedy in, in 1961, just basically promising something that we didn't even have at that point. He says, well, we're putting a rocket on the moon. We're putting a man on the moon in, before the end of the decade. And, and people said he was really just bullying the audience, but he did it. They all yeah. did. And so you're you're handing us that parable there. And and I'm thrilled for selfish reasons also that you're talking about uh, you're talking about a, another generation, that you're talking about what a, a previous generation has offered. And and I think that's wonderful. I think yeah. that's marvelous. Oh, I look forward to your film. Oh, that's, that's thank you. That's really great. Um, Robert, tell me about your flight of fantasy. Uh, hi there, Jay. Thank you very much for having me. Um, well, my film is uh, called The October Martyr. It's a dystopian fiction film that was written by uh, a friend of mine named Jacob Davison. It's about a judge in a, to in a totalitarian uh, society who hands down summary executions like they're hotcakes on a daily basis. And um, the film itself covers the events that happen when one of the prisoners who shows up refuses to be intimidated by um, by this man's <laughs> casual wielding of death. Basically, <clears throat> glad you started with the um, Rod Serling story because this this short was very much inspired by the Twilight Zone. Though even though like censorship today isn't the same the same that it was um, in the 1950s, the um, what what the Serling approach gave us was instead of uh, instead of censorship, it gave us like a universality, a like way of like speaking to um, modern themes without doing one specific theme that was like, if you make it about this one news story happening now, it's gonna be dated in five minutes, especially with how fast the news cycle works. So that was, that's sort of the general, general picture of our film. I, 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 and I see the nodding from Jen. So she's probably going to chime in with the same thing here. I remember a Twilight Zone with Burgess Meredith as a, a librarian. And, yep. and, <laughs> books, and books became extinct. And mm -hmm. that's that was a big influence, uh, both visually and, and tonally. I thought so. Very interesting. Je Jen, I'm seeing you nod all over the place. What's uh, what's your take on this? Well, it's funny. Um, the image of Judge Dredd popped into my head <laughs> <laughs> when you described the film. Um, so it sounds very interesting. I'd love to see it. Um, uh, why? Uh, something like this, I, I, I say yay, um, and I could go on for an hour about why I think it's a brilliant concept. Why? Why did you do it? Um, for this one, it was a combination of factors, but mostly just um, political outrage. It feels like uh, living in America, especially, it feels like every other week, if you're a member of any sort of oppressed or marginalized community, you see a news story where it's ex-conservative group is trying to push a new legislation about why they don't believe that you're human, that you deserve basic dignity. Um, so it began with discussions between me and the writer about the news stories that made us the most outraged, that made us want to like turn our art into activism. And um, then we settled on this script that he'd actually written years ago. Um, and we found a w ways to update it without being too on the nose. And then as we were filming, um, the news broke that Roe versus Wade was going to be repealed 
and this became a big topic in rehearsal and in discussion about like what people like in our cast and on our crew how it like the the basically the the ways in which we feel othered or like we feel like the government doesn't treat us as human and so that's where the where the lens that we um that we approach the story came from but it was also like the sad thing about uh, about living in America in general is that it feels like every single like tiny scrap of progress is one through like extreme effort and so um so it was a lot of just expelling those emotions into into a movie that we hope is a, is entertaining and fun to watch i you you're exemplifying my point once again that in the middle of your movie you just looked at your your film and said uh oh that that could be reality if we're not careful wow well done well done um another proof the the clairvoyance of of science fiction and fantasy um andre I, I love your background. I'm calm looking at it. Uh, tell me all about your movie. Hi, Jay. Um, and thank you, Jay and um, Jen, for putting this together. So uh, my movie is Revelation to the Disembodied. And um, it is the second installment in a trilogy that I've been working on since 2013. The first one um, is, is on my Vimeo channel, and it is... Um, open to the public called Cyber Genesis. Um, so Revelation to the Disembodied, uh, the, the kind of short synopsis is um, fragments of the collective post-human dream construct a world that straddles hyper-technological, ec ecological, and mythological dimensions. Um, and so between, you know, all, all three of the films in the trilogy, I'm interested in, in exploring this, this idea of if the technology that humans created um, were, were able to create its own mythology, what would that look like? You know, maybe assuming that humans are not in the picture and this is maybe in the far distant future or something like that. But in any any case, technology is creating a it, its own version of uh, its creation and, you know, us as the gods and how would it see us and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, one thing that's kind of been interesting that's said today, you know, the, the word apocalypse has come come up a few times and, you know, revelation, um, which is the first word of, of my title and apocalypse are, are somewhat synonymous. Um, but, you know, the you know, the what I find interesting is that when we culturally think of of this idea of apocalypse, we think of the end of the world. But you know, to sort of trace the etymology to 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 its Greek origins, you know, apocalypse simply means like unveiling or a revelation. So, um, you know, what does that then mean? Maybe it's the end of one thing, a beginning of an of another thing. And so, um, there there are elements, you know, in the in the sort of the the style of the film that play with this idea of unveiling or revelation. And if if this were to happen to either this future technology or even to us on another way, um, th you, there might be something destabilizing about it as well. Um, and so the the style of my film really plays around with like the, the the voiceover narration is not sort of linear, it's circular, the dialogue loops back on itself. There's a lot of sort of um, riddles in there and that kind of thing. And so the viewer is meant to likewise be kind of like destabilized and have this experience of having to navigate this sort of new reality after the unveiling, after the revelation. Um, uh, one, one, a couple of things that I'll mention too, uh, you know, the film was three years in the making um, and it's <laughs> nine and a half minutes long. And I find that interesting in a way. And so much, um, so much research, and, and I'm sure everybody here can relate to this, that there's a lot of research, a lot of study that goes into the planning of a film, whether that be, you know, planning the film itself or researching the topics that get explored in the film. Um, and 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 all the audience ever gets of this is like whatever short amount of time that it's on screen. So I will do a little plug and mention that I also have a website, Andre Silva Space, and I have a blog where I started uh, on this website where I started writing 
about a lot of the ideas that went into the film. So, yeah. In nine minutes. <laughs> oh. Um this is this is why I applaud the 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 indie filmmaker the what you have what, what what you've told us now that you put into nine minutes must be incredible how did you determine how did you all determine what we see you gave us an intricate thing regarding revelations mythology cultures and everything how how do you determine those nine minutes how do you determine what we see what 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 sparks in you the that says okay now they'll understand it. Now this is this is exactly right. What sparks in, in all of you for that? Um, that's a really that's a really good question. And you know, it's I don't think that I've consciously sort of considered like, okay, this has got to this can stay, this, you know, this has got to go for now. Um I think, you know, it's I think, you know, I've been making films for a <laughs> A few decades now and one thing that i've learned along the way is just to kind of really trust my gut and what feels right um and if something feels right it's included in the film and if it's not it's, it doesn't but one way i kind of get around that is you know i try to rather than think of you know the film linearly like okay i only have nine and a half minutes like actually have it be in layers where maybe on this one layer there's this kind of literal story of um, you know, as there is in the film, it, it, the voiceover narrator discusses, you know, walking uh, with the dog on the beach at sunrise and the dog finds a shovel. And so there's this very sort of like linear narration. But then there's each thing in that in that basic story about walking one's dog on the beach and, and et cetera, et cetera. Every element of that has like a a second or third meaning to it it's so it's it, you know again like mythology nothing is you know nothing is to be taken literally everything has sometimes like multiple levels of meaning so i guess that's one way maybe i work around it it's by you know if i were to expand the film out maybe it would go from like nine and a half minutes to being like an hour if i you know if i were able to sort of like unstack all the different layers of meaning and lie them side by side. And so I guess, you know, to answer your question, maybe that's one way that I do it is just to sort of think about things on a on a, a vertical plane where I can attach like multiple levels of meaning to like any given second of the film. It's it's sort of like a television series. Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this is somewhat like a television series. You know, something happens in episode one and we don't see it even come to play again for three, four, five episodes, if not the next season. Uh, and we always have to have that lay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember from that 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 episode or that character is now coming back. So you're sort of handing the audience. It's it's like saying, okay, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Now you better remember it and think about it. Right. Wow. You are giving your audience immense control. <laughs> Well, and there are lines that, that come back and make one reconsider you know, maybe maybe not it's it, i know that it, it can be maybe a little bit too you know it can be very like understated at times but with regard to the story the character walking uh the dog on the beach and what happens there's something there's like a subtle hint at the toward the end of that section where you know the the voiceover says you've had it all backwards and to me i don't know what that might mean to the audience but to me that's also like the the entire narration is flipped so it's like the the person walking the dog is actually the dog not understanding the shovel that it encounters and so that you know could potentially make the viewer reconsider everything that the viewer watched up into that point and then it's it's an entirely different story it was there was an ec comic once where um the, it started with a man walking his dog and it turned out it was the dog walking the man <laughs> So there's a great irony that you're giving right. us. Right. Okay. Okay. I, you, your, yours is one of those films I have to sit down, calmly sit. Okay. I need a cup of coffee in my hand. Okay. <laughs> and go. And I have to watch that film. Excellent. 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 Good luck to you with that. Ben, Ben, tell me about Zero Method. Hey, Jay, Jen. It's good to be chatting with you guys today. How's everybody doing? Uh, Absolutely great. Feeling good. <clears throat> Zero Method is actually a uh, sci-fi pilot for an independent TV series 
minutes. It's a 22 and a half minute pilot. Um, it is an action adventure, cyberpunk, time travel, mystery drama. And uh, it's set in a future in which uh, time travel has proliferated. And there's all different kinds of methods for time travel, different ways that people go back and forth through time. But there's one thing that's true about all these methods. It's this prime rule of time travel that cannot be broken. And it's this idea that if you go into the future, you can stay there as long as you want. But if you go into the past, farther back in time you go, the shorter the amount of time you have to stay. And our story concerns Zero, Ethan Locke. He's a chrono refugee, a Zero, who's been flung forward in time to the year 2081. And so he's trapped there because now if he wants to return home, he can only stay there for a matter of minutes before he's zapped back. And so he survives in this new future um, by being working as a, a time criminal selling his skills and going back in time, uh, working for this syndicate. And um, our pilot concerns an opportunity he has to go back to the point in time where he was once from. Now he knows he can't stay there, but he's addict addicted to going back and visiting his old life, the sort of nostalgic addiction uh, to a time before. Uh, but in this opportunity to go back, this job, he's gonna just have this little moment in time um, to, to touch his old life it, it, it is a moment of betrayal for his partner who's sending him back. Now, our pilot uh, really goes off to the races when he's approached by this rogue group of time travelers, this rogue group of zeros who save him. And they say, hey, you know, everything you've learned is not true. There's actually a way you can go back and stay back. There's a method for zeros like us to return to our own time and you, and you can stay there. And that is the zero method. And that's the mystery of the show. What is the zero method? And will Ethan be able to stay back in time? Or is it a matter of him just accepting his new place in this, in this terrible future that he's found? And I think it's something that we can all relate to. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an action drama mystery, but it's also about grief and loss and trauma. And it was really inspired around the events of the pandemic, this political upheaval that we've had in our country. And I think we can all relate to the idea of finding ourselves in a future that we did not expect, that we are not happy with, and the desire to go back just when things were better. So it's a struggle between actually finding the solution and being at peace with the situation that he's in. Immense parables in there, immense parables. How many of us, if we had, if there was a gadget somewhere that could bring us, we're talking about Doctor Who this season. So of course, mm -hmm. if we can go back in time, how many of us would? Um, Jen, what do you think of that? What do you think about the notion of going back? to to our world to an old world Going back in time yeah um i i like the idea you know if certain positive changes could be made if sorries could be said if different paths could be forged and forged in a much better way that's interesting sorries could be said yes how many of us muse and say oh if i only had that one moment again uh, what prompted you, Ben, to, to create this? Because this is an immense parable. This is a huge, the, I, I, I could go on for hours on the parables I'm, I'm seeing just in your description of it. What prompted you to do it? What, what, what was in you to say, this is, this is how I'm going to talk about the present by utilizing the future in this way? Well, I wanted to create a story that had these, you know, complex uh, themes and dealt with these cyberpunk issues of having a piece of technology. In the case of this show, the technology is time travel and how this technology affects society and, and our humanity. Um, but I also wanted to tell a story that was super grounded. This is really about the interaction that these characters have. And yes, there are these complex time travel rules, but it's really about trust between characters. How are we going to band together to move forward? And I think that in a time when we're dealing with so much trauma and so many complicated problems in society, I think uh, telling a story that is really character driven about how folks need to come together to resolve these issues as a team was something that I really wanted to bring forward as well as just create like a fun action sci-fi time travel mystery. There's some action sequences in it, a big, big fight set piece. So I wanted to entertain, but I also wanted to give people a bit of drama to hold on to and a little bit of hope. Interesting, very interesting. Um, the 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 notion of community is coming in, and I it's as we get more technologically, and I'm hearing two two big themes going on here. We're hearing we're hearing uh, uh, technology coming after us in some ways, and the apocalypse. And mm -hmm. you're you're sort of saying maybe maybe we can all save ourselves if we just. If we just looked up and said hello to somebody once in a while, if we just 
extended our hand. Absolutely. Oh, so many parallels in that. Thank you. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I'm I'm actually uh, completing a book about the the parables within horror and science fiction, and I'm hearing things. It, if if you get a phone call from me, or if I see you at the event, and I say, "So, did you mean to say?" You, I, it's it's me wanting to quote you. Well done, everyone. We had we had someone who just arrived now, David. David, tell us about your movie. What's 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 science fantastic about you? Hi everyone. Sorry that I messed up the time changes being on the opposite side of the world. Um, Where are was, you now? You say I'm in, I'm in Madrid right now, Madrid, Spain. What time is yeah. it? Yeah, it is six forty one p.m. PM, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I, 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 I thought, and then I looked again, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just a bit of a, but it's okay. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I am the director of Everyone Will Burn, which is, uh, you know, it's a religious horror movie that uh, we made here in Spain about um, vengeance. I mean, we did the universal horror sort of core of vengeance. We wanted to take it to. You know, here in in a, we wanted to show a small town in Spain that traditional sort of, you know, old Europe um, small town vibe that I grew up in, um, and really we wanted to add the story of a uh, you know this woman who who had a you know had a child that had dwarfism and got bullied essentially to death, and um, this woman is pretty much ready to take her life, and then. Um, the devil in the form of a child appears to her and says, well, I think I can help you then, you know, avenge your child and your child's death. So it is a movie about evil partnering up with evil and where there is really no like good uh, in the movie. There's really no character that you're like, ah, that's, that's, that's the protagonist. That's the good one. That's the one we need to follow. That's, that's her. It's actually a movie of bad people screwing over worse people. Um, and that was something that was very attractive to us because when you're, you know, shooting it and when you're watching this movie, um, the protagonist, uh, you understand her state of mind because everything she's had to go through, but absolutely none of her methods uh, are, I guess, uh, you know, you would sign off on them, you know, and, and that was something that uh, was very, very exciting to us to blend sort of, you know, the, the Spanish lore, the mythology, the religiousness, that sort of very uh, extreme and intense um, practices that are still going on today. Like if, if you travel through the small, small towns, you can still feel the remnants of, of that old world and, and, you know, and bring it sort of towards that new mentality and, and have people that are not of those small towns confront these situations. So the movie plays a lot with the fact that nobody really truly believes that this child is who she says she is. And everyone is kind of like, it's really no way. There's really no way that this could be going on. And that feeds into the sort of the crazy vibe and the crazy atmosphere of it all. The fact that I'm pretty much until the end, nobody really believes what's going on. And, um, and and that makes for a lot of fun, funny, and definitely very extreme situations that I, I think we have in, in the movie. So yeah, that's pretty much everyone will burn in a little nutshell. The fact that you had this big smile at the end, yes, that's how it is. Everyone's been. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Everyone's that, you know. That's great. You know what? That's 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 pervasive in in genre films these days. It used to be okay for every Darth Vader, there's a Luke Skywalker, but mm -hmm. we don't have that anymore. Now it's it's, you know, we root for we don't root for. I won't call them the villain. I'll call them the anti-hero. I'll call them. You know, they had to do what they had mm -hmm. to do. Uh, uh, and, I think we're I, more used to, sorry, to sorry, 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 no, cut you off. Please, please, please. No, I, I was just going to say, I think collective pain in the past few years is something that everybody kind of has come together in. I, I think because we've had something that everybody felt a somewhat similar pain to, I think our level and our degree of collective pain and our awareness to each other and what, well, you know, the fact that people are going through things, I don't think was that much registered. That's why we've had the movies we've had. And I think now you can definitely see a tendency of people that are like, ah, you're in pain, I'm in pain, or pain might not be the same, but we understand why you might do what you might do and why she might do what she might do. And that was sort of like a core principle of our character. You, you will pretty much not agree with anything she's doing the entire movie, yet you understand it. I love that. That that sparks a major question. I'm asking everyone. 
hear this. It's very easy now to say something like, oh, how has the pandemic changed you? Everyone, everyone does that. It's the knee jerk. Oh, pandemic. Um, uh, like, uh, like I've mentioned, I, I teach at university. And if my students don't want to come to class, they just say I have COVID and, and I have to shut up. So, so it, it's a knee jerk thing, but let's get specific. We're in a brand new paradigm. We're in a new world. As I said at the beginning, most science fiction films of the last 50 years have to change their thought because we had a pandemic. And you talked about collective pain. I'm asking everyone, what's the new pain? What's the new reality? What's the new obstacle in this new world? Okay. Oh, COVID pandemic. Got it. What did it do to you? Nicholas, what did it do to you as a filmmaker, as a person? What did it do to you? Uh, hmm. I think it brought into sharp relief. And this is going to be funny if you watch my short film, because there is a reference in it to quarantine and it's post-apocalypse and there's no one around, but we shot this before COVID. So just a complete Ooh. coincidence that it ended up involving that. Uh -huh. um, but I think it really brought into sharp relief just what, um, what loneliness can do to people and what disconnection can do with people and how many false forms of connection we have right now. Like I also, I always talk about social media in terms of like the social version of empty calories. It's like eating Doritos instead of a, a meal. Um, and what is the consequence, the more we consume social junk food that's not actually feeding us, and then realizing that a lot of this social junk food is being created by these sort of artificial intelligence algorithms that are getting more and more impenetrable to us and are steering us to their own ends. Like, if we start working for the robots, will we even notice or will it just be, we woke up and Facebook told us what to do and we did it. Um, so I feel like we have, uh, it has really been a, a jolt to the system of like, this is a moment when we need to realize and redefine connection and rediscover what connection is, genuine connection between people. I like I like that a lot. It's it's funny you say that. I remember January of 1985, a newscaster was talking to, I don't remember who, uh, pardon me, I don't remember who at this point, but he had said, wow, isn't it great? We escaped George Orwell's 1984. And whomever he was talking to said, are you kidding? We're in the middle of it and we just don't know it. So you, the social media junk food, yes, I, I had the little orange dust on me from, from such things and uh, really brilliant. Okay, okay. Um, ABC, tell me, what's your new pain? Now, the, after everything, what's the new pain? What's the new obstacle? I think what COVID did is it's pretty trite to say, but you look around and you see what's really important, who's important and what's important. And I think then for me, the new pain is having to deal with so much shit that's not really important and COVID let you judge that. And so I try to let go very quickly of things that don't really matter really the core of what matters. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, if you could say that over and over again, if I can record you saying it and then just listen to it over and over again, maybe we'll all have better lives. Well said. Joan, the new obstacle, what's in front of you now? New obstacle. I mean, I, I think that what COVID felt like was, I think maybe for, for, lucky people in my generation, you know, like growing up in the 90s, like the worst thing that ever happened was that OJ Simpson killed his wife and Bill Clinton may or may not have had sex with his intern. And that was just the worst thing in the world. And so I feel like living through COVID, it was it was very much a worldview shattering. It was like, oh, things can get really, really bad <laughs> um, in, in the real world too. Uh, so I think that kind of fundamental level of worldview shattering, it, it's very, it lends itself to questioning a lot of very fundamental things about how to live, uh, how you do things, but may, maybe in very good ways too for creative work, you know, like, you know, how do, how do, how do we make films? Like, what can we do differently? Or how, what kind of story can we tell in, in a new worldview? You, you, you remind me, my father-in-law used to say, we're, we're all weak because we didn't go through a war. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we did now. Yes, yes, we did. And we're still in it. It's, it's almost like Vietnam. It's like, did it end? Will it end? Will it ever end? David. Yeah, really. 
uh, uh, David, uh, what what did you take away from your movie? Because you you sparked the question in me. What what's the new obstacles? What's the new what's the new uh, 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 broken leg out there? What did you take away from your film? I I think I mean I I think going back to what we're talking about, I think personally the fact that we we all had time to reflect and think and judge ourselves and. This might be a little existentialist, but I think the fact that we had so much time for ourselves um, made it so that, um, you know, I think that like it was said, we we really had time to figure out what was important and what's not. And we realized that socially, a big percentage of what we were all doing was is, is completely non-important. And that has created, I think, a great growth individually for a lot of people, hopefully. But I think socially, we're all realizing like we don't really want to partake in, in, in the game of it all. And that is very complicated when we all want to be artists and we need electricians, right? So I think that's that's kind of like what I took away. And in our film, in fact, when, when we wrote it, it was like right at the beginning of COVID, you know, my partners and I sat down and we're like, well, this is going to go for a long time. So we started to realize that we caught ourselves watching less and less, a lot of times good movies or like dramatic movies or social movies because everything going around was kind of drilling our brains all the time like everybody's dying everything is terrible you can't buy food you can't buy toilet like it was just such bad all the time that we wanted to do something really fun and that's kind of I guess that's what sparked our script that the, the need of, of of wanting to have something fun to watch and not you know sort of like look outside the window you all everything you see is shit and then you look at the screen and you're like ah that per that fictional person's life is just as bad as that person right there, you know. So, I guess we wanted to have something fun, and and I don't know. That was our train of thought at the moment. It's interesting, Joe Mo, who who um, because of his writing and because of his associations, was connected to some of the more iconic horror and science fiction personalities of of time gone by. Described the pandemic as all of us being sent to our room without any supper. Uh, and and so yeah, you're so, you're sort of saying that there you are. Okay, go to your room and think about what you've done. Mm -hmm. Really interesting, Robert. What's what's what's, what's new what's life, life for you now? As you as you go outside, what's the new obstacle? What's the new world looking like to you? Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna lightly contend uh, against what some people have been saying in this in this uh, panel so far. In that, I do think there is like obviously the empty calorie thing that Nicholas was talking about with social media is a very cogent point. I do think, however, one thing that we have gained in particular from this experience of being forced to like treat out treat anywhere like going outdoors outside of our homes as a danger zone has sort of expanded the way we think about what our what our what our bubbles are, what our circles are, what our like what our minds can even accomplish. And for me, like through the forced isolation, one is for, one is forced almost to find community with people who are not sharing the same continent as you. And that is one of the tremendous upsides. And it, it shows that like there is a solidarity amongst people. Um, my workforce, I'm laid off now, but we unionized during the, during the quarantine because we could get away with it because our bosses weren't staring over our shoulders. The, the whole idea of like, not necessarily being in the same space, being more artificial, is kind of a false one that we've imposed on ourselves when we allow the big the big corporations to tell us what is and isn't valid social interaction. So I think for me the challenge that goes into the into the new world is taking the like the realized version of myself that came from the like all the self reflection, all the like quiet moments in the in the room during like the quarantine and basically like reconciling that with the version of my life that was on the rails beforehand, just like going from, you know, groceries to parties with friends. So like, you know, just the, like the obligations that everyone was on uh, when we could, when like every space was just as safe um, if we're, if you're not immunocompromised. So yeah, that's, that's my uh, mental challenge. Now it's reconciling the like post-human experience of like your friend groups are all on discord or all like, a phone tap away versus you actually still have neighbors. <laughs> um, so that's that's really interesting to me and is something that I hope as artists we we get more latitude to explore because it's tremendously interesting. It's devilishly hard to portray on film because film obviously is so biased towards characters in the same room talking to each other. Like depicting internet interactions on film is often like very dire. Anyways, I'm, I'm mid-ramble. That's my general thought.
<laughs> that's that's really interesting. The 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 phrase which I've never said, uh, maybe more than once once a year, which I've been saying every day these uh, now is what time is it over there? Uh, the people I'm speaking to, the the even even my colleagues, there are people that I meet almost every day now that I say, hey, I never met you in person, but I've known you for years. So yeah, you're you're really making a statement about community. That's really interesting. Hmm. Billy, what's what what's what's making you think these days? Um, I mean, I probably won't say anything different than what what's already been said, but I think um, sort of forced forced me to think differently creatively. I mean, the, the pandemic happened in the middle of filming of this documentary. And first thought was, how are we going to finish this? You know, this is on hold indefinitely, but, um, you know, start to figure out different ways to tell this story and, and to make it happen and just think in different ways and how to, yeah, just think creatively um, that I wouldn't have otherwise thought of you know, there's certain, this is how you make a documentary and you, you have to do it these certain ways. But with the pandemic that opened up new ideas and practices and um, that I think made this film special in the end where I originally thought like, oh no, this is done for. Um, so that would be my big takeaway. Um, just open up more possibilities and how to think and how to make something. I'm going to talk about that at the end because you're, you're thinking the way I'm thinking. I'm I'll, I'll just say uh, the pandemic was awful, but I, I don't hate it. Uh, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ben, Ben, uh, uh, you can't travel in time. You got to deal with the time you're in. Tell me about yours. Oh, that's exactly right, Jay. You know, I like actually in thinking about that, I've got to throw it way back. You know, the first thing that came to my head is this uh, quote from the old miniseries, I, Claudius, and Derek Jacobi says, um, let all the poisons hatch out. And I just think of it like the pandemic put a spotlight. It cracked everything open. It put a spotlight on so many issues in our society that needed to be fixed, so many inequities, whether they're economic or racial or political. And I think it made it so that we, before the pandemic, you could afford to have blind spots to some of these things. But afterwards, everything just became so apparent and it was so in your face. And so I think about the virtue of that, the poisoning, uh, the poisons leaching out. At least we know now there's no cover for any of the problems that we have in our world, which demands that you go out and solve them. It demands that you go out and reconcile all those things. Okay. The degree to which we're able to do that, I don't know, but I certainly feel like myself, and I, I feel like my friends and my family and the people I interact with are more aware of the problems in our society. And that makes it easier for us to go figure out how we're going to tackle them. So I definitely agree with uh, Robert's point of view about creating these new circles. And from Nick, what Nicholas was saying about the challenges and the need for that, about the social uh, media junk food. But I think that like understanding those new problems is driving people to figure out new paradigm shifting ways to fix them, despite all the trauma that it caused. I guess that's why we were told as kids, go to your room and think about what you've done. We did. And yeah, yeah, we did. We, now we have to, now we have to fix it. Um, well put. And I, I saw everyone's energy when you said that. Everyone was like, yeah, that's right, we do. Oh my God. So yeah, you bring up an excellent point. Andre. Andre, what's uh, what's what's the world like from your desk? So, um, well, one thing you know, I I often joke with my friends and family that you know that there was such a big deal. I remember in the the run up to the 2012 like winter solstice into the Mayan calendar, and then the next day or the next year, people are like, ah, eh, you know, that was a joke. I always joke that it's like. Well, you know, maybe we all did flip into another timeline because the past 10 years or so have been really, really weird and surreal um, for a variety of reasons. You know, one thing that's interesting is a lot of, you know, the pandemic has come up quite a few times. And, um, you know, I've been personally, I've been kind of 
fortunate to have a job, you know, as a professor at home where I could teach my classes online and this kind of thing. You and me both. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it, it's been really, really great from that standpoint. And the thing, what was so weird about it, especially for our family, is we have like, there are multiple health issues going on in our house. So um, that had prevented us from moving around before the pandemic. So actually, when things did kind of lock down, in a way, we had more, you know, because we are fortunate to have the jobs that we we do. Um, in some ways, we had more freedom, you know, during especially during those first few years and like what happened with Zoom and like sort of everybody connecting online. Um, but I think one of the challenges that has kind of crept up and it's like, you know, as media makers, how does one navigate this is that, you know, as people went more online, uh, and my film deals with this idea of mind uploading, which, you know, is not necessarily a literal thing. Like to some extent, we've all uploaded to the to an online environment. In a sense, we our consciousness is there a lot of the time, whether it's for work or, or leisure or that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, because of that and because of that huge spike because of COVID and then more and more people were online, there's a lot of media being created, a lot of TikTok videos or what have you. And there's so much content and, you know, pot potentially so many people speaking that who are the people who have time in the midst of that to listen? And so I think that's kind of where we are now is there's kind of a glut of, of content. And as, as people making films, what do we do about that? Not just so that it's like, well, so that our stuff comes to the top, but like, how do we, how do we create sort of a media ecology that's, you know, where one doesn't, you know, where there's not so much sort of like, you know, <laughs> real, you know, real estate that's being developed and overdeveloped and that kind of thing. So I think that's something, you know, that I consider sort of moving on into the future is like, how do I create or do I create even, but how do I create media that's, you know, maybe uh, not, not, it's not something that I have to create immediately in 15 minutes and it doesn't have to be really loud and it doesn't have to scream the loudest, but maybe like, how do I create something that, you know, uh, you know, maybe it does take a lot longer to create, um, but it, it for me at least, maybe it has a lot more depth to it so that when I do put it out, you know, it's it's not just more traffic. You're, you're exemplifying a, a point that, that I, I felt when this pandemic started. I'll mention that in a minute, but first, Jen, take us home. Uh, now, now your, your, I, I know your whole existence was outside of the house, and then it what? wasn't. What's, what's, how is the new, what's your new reality? What's Jen's new reality? Well, I'm outside of the house again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> happened recently. I'm thrilled to be able to enjoy. You're almost outside the house. You froze on my screen. A restaurant again and soon to be live again, hopefully. Um, my domestic partner, Paul, just gigged in Chicago and he's got a couple of other gigs lined up. So I'm looking forward to performing again. I'm a rock singer um, in addition to being a, a writer. So um, my reality is much better now. <laughs> That's interesting. You're saying your reality is much better. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's different? When you go out there now, does it feel the same? It took a while for me to not be reticent to be near people. But now I'm I'm very okay. Yes. A level of caution. It feels, it feels okay again. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll close uh, by, by saying I, I agree with what Billy was saying and Andre. When, when, uh, the, when the pandemic first started, there was uh, a telethon that Rosie O'Donnell did for Broadway performers for the Actors Fund. And I remember watching it. I, I work heavily in the theater, so I, I, was, I was in support. And a, an epiphany came over me as I saw Matthew McConaughey in his basement, unshaven, playing an acoustic guitar or Audra McDonald uh, singing in her bathroom. Uh, uh, and, and obviously she had not been to the makeup room just yet uh, when she did it. And it, I realized that the playing field now for me the the playing field is leveled. We have a level playing field. 
we call ourselves indie filmmakers, but now we had the same obstacles as, as the, the, the billion dollar studio films. Theater productions, whether you're off off Broadway or on Broadway, you had the same thing. When you were on Zoom, it was your face on a little box, just as the people you used to put on a pedestal. And I think what the pandemic did, and this is why I say, I don't hate the pandemic. I hate what it did, but it knocked the pedestal off. And we are all equals now. We were all equals in strife for many years. And we are, we are walking out of the same door when uh, uh, I, I can cite Alfred Hitchcock's movie Lifeboat or I don't know how many science fiction films where there is an apocalypse. And before the apocalypse, there's that wealthy person, the intelligent person, the whatever, they, they, there's so many different people. And then when the door is open, it's, it's just your feet stepping out into the world. And I think we all have that opportunity to, to say, okay, uh, we were all behind a door, whatever, whatever size the door was, we were all behind it. Now we're stepping out of it. And what do we do with what we have? So the notion of, of, of I, I'm hearing about religion and mythology and spirituality. What do we do and what, what, what are we doing on this planet is so much more important, I think, to so many of us. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate all of you for being here and for uh, for sharing your movies with us. I can't wait to see them. I can't wait to learn more about them. Please keep in touch. Tell me what's going on with it. And how many of you are going to be in Boston for the event? I'll be there, yeah. I'll see you there. Excellent. Look for me. I'll be in the one in the Doctor Who scarf. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jen. We're, we're going to a next group of panelists. And so I wanted to say thank you to everyone. Good luck to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival starts February 15. Uh, in Boston, go to bostonsci-fi.com to find out information and tickets. And the Boston Sci-Fi Channel goes live that same time. So if you can't make it, log on and get, and get eons and eons worth of fantastic television. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jay.